Hi, my name's Khadifa Wong and I'm the director of Uprooted. Hi, my name is Zach Nemerin and I am the original concept guy, co-creator, and I did additional choreography for the film. Jazz is in a place of flux at the moment. There's a little bit of confusion about whether or not it's necessary or whether it's relevant. What is jazz in the 21st century? Where is it going? Is it still holding on to the values of where it came from? The aesthetic has changed so much that we don't recognize it today. I think it's also where is the support for the community that this art form comes from. And when people would say, this dance is cool, but I don't want to mess with you as a person, there's danger in that. We go to these studios, we go to these universities, and you get one side of the picture. And there's a whole other side that y'all don't even know. That is the trailer for the recently released documentary, Uprooted, the story of jazz dance. And this is Factual America. Factual America is produced by Alamo Pictures, a production company specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for an international audience. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood, and every week we look at America through the lens of documentary filmmaking by interviewing filmmakers and experts on the American experience. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to be the first to hear about new productions, to find out where you can see our films, and to connect with our team. The history of jazz dance is the history of America. That history is not well documented, however, especially when it comes to the leading role played by African Americans. In Uprooted, The Journey of Jazz Dance, filmmakers Kadifa Wong and Zach Nemerin trace jazz dance back to its roots in Africa and follow its evolution up to the present. Along the way, Kadifa and Zach address difficult subjects such as appropriation, racism, and sexism within this uniquely American art form, and in the process shine a light on this chapter in America's history. But in the end, their film is a celebration of this most human of art forms, or as they say, what all people have in common is rhythm and a basic human need to get down. We join Kadifa and Zach from their homes in London, England. Kadifa Wong and Zach Nemerin, welcome to Factual America. Kadifa and Zach's film is Uprooted, The Journey of Jazz Dance. And first of all, what I should do is uh, congratulate you all on the release of your film. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's quite an accomplishment these days. I, we've got a lot of people on here who haven't been able to get their films uh, released because of COVID, but uh, uh, is it was that a premiere at the Dance on Camera Film Festival? It was, yeah. It was the first first public screening in the world premiere, so we were very lucky. COVID hit just as we finished all the major components, so we were very fortunate in an unfortunate situation. Yeah, well, you've already got uh, reviews, and uh, I've seen in Hollywood Reporter uh, mentions in New York Times, so. Uh, so well done. And any other festivals that you're scheduled to be yeah. at? Um, in August, we're at the Rhode Island International Film Festival. So that's going to be fun. And we're looking forward to that. Again, it's going to be virtual, but we'll get, that's our second stop on the, uh, on the promotion tour. So that's good. Okay. And our, so at this stage, it's limited to festivals. It's not showing anywhere yet. Yeah. But we, yeah. Can, we can talk a little bit more about that later in the... Uh, our, in our chat. Uh, so, well, as you've just said, you uh, finished this just as, uh, or did most of the finishing just before uh, COVID hit, but how have you guys been doing? Zach, how are, you're both in London, I'm in Leeds, so, you know, in theory, we could have met up someplace, maybe. Oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, how are things, uh, how are you faring down there in, in London? I think things are things are okay, and and this particular film is keeping us very busy at the moment, and we're we're just beginning our little promotion uh, tour for the film festival circuit, and and I think we're just in dialogue, mm. continued dialogue, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is. Great. To do from home, strangely enough, it's been rather comforting being able to do it at home. You're a bit more flexible, and you're a bit more comfortable. I think for the first time I've ever really done interviews, it's been really nice to be mm. somewhere healthy. 
Yeah, or not, yeah, not exactly, not having to rush to a studio someplace or, or whatever, so. Uh, I mean, it would be nice to be going to our premieres, like flying out to the Lincoln Center in New York and, <laughs> and Rhode Island. It would be lovely to go and visit and kind of, you know, get the red carpet feel and experience, but, you know, this is the world we live in. Yeah, it, it is, and, and uh, I know you already feel, uh, you're very thankful for the fact that you've been able to get this film out and uh, out in front of people. And I, thanks for mentioning Lincoln Center. I forgot to mention that, that was, that's, uh, seems like quite a quite an accomplishment so uh um so that's that's all it's all going very well and uh just to remind our listeners we're talking about jazz dance now uh as i've already alluded to before we uh started this recording as uh, i was going to ask you some very basic questions so so bear with me but um what is jazz dance that is the question that yeah, every yeah. single person will ask and no one can really give a definitive answer yeah. um as an educator mm -hmm. sorry to jump in kadifa but Don't as an educator that. um i would always you know attribute jazz dance as a teacher to having rhythm syncopation dynamics use of isolation, so the different parts of the body, using different parts of the body in isolation to the rest. Um, have a, also have a sense of improvisation and almost, it doesn't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, it's gotta have yeah. swing, gotta have that yeah. essence of coolness to it as well. So it's like a lot of things you kind of, you know it when you see it, is that kind of it? Is that, is we that what... try very hard to get a definition in the film. We asked a lot of people that we interviewed what the first question that we asked was what is jazz dance and that never sort of set the interviews off right because people would go um uh <laughs> we got rid of that question after about six interviews and we're like oh this, this is proving harder to answer than we thought um and that's part of what the film is about trying to answer that question because yeah. there's you know very set sections of dancers and practitioners that have varying ideas for various reasons what jazz dance is and and we decided that we weren't going to be able to answer that question definitively we had to get a lot of people to answer that question for us yeah you know what i was going to say is someone who um i mean my formative years were 70s 80s in the united states i mean i had my own you know you say jazz dance i had my own idea what that what that meant and i mean it's what struck me watching the film is that that the definition has changed each decade has hasn't it it's it's this yeah. whole evolving form yeah absolutely it's more of a popular dance form that, that was happening at the time and the music that was happening at the time but it started in the jazz age and in the yeah. jazz era and hence that name jazz dance i think has just stuck but yeah. depending on who you speak to it will be a very different de definition yeah i think um well as as we Kind of explore this a little further. Uh, I, maybe this, I think this one still for, for Zach. I mean, let's do a little, uh, Zach, uh, do, let's do a little dance uh, glossary here. Uh, okay. Because it comes up, because it, it, I was watching this. And so for, first of all, for the rest of the show, if you just say jazz, we know you're talking about jazz dance. Because that, that, I had to think, keep thinking, because I'm a big jazz music fan. And, mm. uh, and I kept thinking, wait a minute. You know, oh, I see, you know, kind of, kind of thing. Social dance. So social dance, what's social dance? Okay, so I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna deviate ever so slightly. Please do. There's, there's a wonderful image that um, Kimberly Tester drew um, of a tree. And this is the easiest way mm. to kind of explain the different stages and different eras yeah. of jazz dance. So if you think about the roots of jazz dance, the roots of the tree being in African social dance, and then by way of the transatlantic slave trade, yeah. those various peoples were taken past the Middle Passage into the Americas. And we think of all of those kind of culminations of different religious dances, social dances um, coming together in the Americas. And then we begin to call that vernacular, the vernacular jazz. That's my next question, yeah, yeah. okay. So, so social dance really is authentic jazz, vernacular jazz, the roots of American, the American version of the African right. diaspora. Right. Mm. Okay. And then, so that takes us, so it becomes this, uh, and, I, and we will, I, I think we will explore a little bit more about, about the, the roots of that tree. But uh, other terms that get thrown about in the film, you talk, hear jazz versus modern versus contemporary. 
Mm. So what's is is is, is brief? You're the teacher, I can tell. So uh, <laughs> we are your students. Tell us what uh, if you as simply as you can. What is the difference between those? So if I if I just continue with the tree a little yeah. bit, this makes it so much easier to explain. Uh, so there was a definite European influence to that vernacular form that uh and in essence that's the ballet influence right um so the offshoot from that vernacular trunk of the tree would become theatrical jazz which is what many people or most people consider to be jazz dance and the founding father of that kind of people who people attribute right the founding father as jack cole right um, right Many different people have different observations and different thoughts upon that, mm -hmm. uh, but there's also tap that's there as well. Mm -hmm. So at that same kind of era, we have the tap st um, starting from its Africanist roots, and we also have theatrical jazz, which is the Europeanist influenced mm -hmm. root tr uh, uh, tree trunk that uh, offshoots from vernacular, which then splits off even further into the modern, into the, all, the, all of the things that you mentioned, okay. um, which are just influenced by, many of them are influenced by cultural um, circumstance and different cultural identities and different cultural movements that come from various different you know, parts of the country, various different parts of the world. Uh, and I think that's the beauty of jazz dance, because it okay. is a cultural thing. It comes from so many different parts of the world, um, not always by means of goodwill. <laughs> well, I, I mean, and, and again, this gets to this one quote you have, uh, jazz dance history is the history of America. I mean, and I think that's, uh, I think the film does an amazing job of, uh, of, of documenting that. I think it's, uh, uh, I think, what was it, Hollywood Reporter certainly said it was uh, uh, extremely illuminating, uh, this film. And I, and I have to agree. I, I, uh, I didn't just watch it twice because I had all this extra time on my hand. I, I think it, I found it very, I, I, I don't remember, I mean, and this is very honest with you, in this particular case, in this your film, I don't remember l learning so much is going to make it sound boring and like really old school <laughs> documentary stuff from like the... 40, 50s are from our school era, uh, age, but uh, it, it, it is, I think, uh, and something we'll get to in more in terms of the timeliness, I, I think it was very illuminating, things that I did, wasn't aware of, like where even the term cakewalk comes from, you know, these, these kind of things, not that that's why you would watch this film, we can give that away, there's no spoil, you know, spoiler <laughs> alerts here, cakewalk is a, one of the early forms of that the that African American slaves uh, a form of dance that they that they engaged in, which actually was them, without the the slave owners realizing it, mocking the, yeah. the slave owners. It was their one outlet. Yeah, an act of rebellion, but artistically. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, so as we're talking about this, these these roots of jazz dance, they're 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 in Africa, aren't they? They that's and that's where you 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 take us back there, don't you? Yeah. We, we wanted to, because not a lot of people recognize that as being the roots of jazz dance. And that's, it's not, it's, it's slightly been, it's always been sort of there, but they've never really acknowledged it properly. And so we thought that's the best place to start the film. And that gives us that kind of linear um, mm. path to follow. Um, and so that was a really good place for us to start that film. We thought start it with the roots and, and move upwards. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely started it there, but we wanted to start it before slavery because, you know, things were happening in Africa and on the African continent yeah. way before, you know, slavery happened and all of those, all of that rich history informed it because the people were taken. So yeah. we felt that was an important place to start was just before slavery and what was happening just before that happened. Okay. And what, you know, again, what I didn't realize is, uh, I mean, I was aware of the Lindy Hop. I didn't realize Personally, I didn't even realize it had roots in, in certainly the Harlem Renaissance and, and, and uh, black history. I think, I mean, is it, is it a very simplistic thing to say that sort of Juba, which was this form of early uh, dance in, in, in the African-American slave uh, culture sort of led to Lindy Hop and the cakewalk kind of, I think one of your, um, I think it's the guy at Duke even talks about cakewalk became the roots of Broadway 
and musicals and these sort of things. So, um, so again, it's, it's this very, uh, I mean, it, it, it is, it just shines a light, not only on jazz dance, but on a, on a, a particular, uh, not just even epic. I mean, it's several centuries of American history that's reflected in this. Um, and um, so once we got, so we get to sort of, you know, past ragtime into Lindy Hops and the, the sort of Broadway, how does it progress from there? Is it, is it fair enough to say it's sort of appropriated by Hollywood? Is that would be fair? Yeah, yeah. I think one of one of the things that happened because, and uh, we had a contributor called Karen Hubbard who said basically it's it, there's a point where it splits, and so the ballet dancers, the modern dancers, the people that were influenced by the ballet of Martha Graham and and Ruth St. Dennis and all of those people, they started to take jazz dance, and so they took it on one part. And that takes us to the Hollywood musical, that takes us to the Broadway. Um, even though there was the presence of, of people like Shuffle Along, the, that black musical, that were on Broadway, the kind of real golden era as it's defined gets taken and is separated. But then social dance Lindy Hop falls along another path, leading us down a path towards hip hop dancing and all of the dances mm. we see in clubs. And so there's two very separate distinct worlds that at various points intersect. But throughout history, we only tend to remember the, the white sort of people that orchestrated that because they had the access and the ability to kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking codify. for? Codify. Codify, thank you, Zach. Codify yeah. their work because they had the, me the legal means to do that. Um, and so that's, that's where, you know, the politics interplays with the arts because there were black people codifying, there were black people doing a lot of those things, but they just didn't have the legal means to put that out into the world. Yeah, and it was even, uh, is it, um, what's his name? Is it Thomas, is it LaFrance? Um, LaFrance. Yeah, at, at Duke, who, um, uh, for clarity's sake, I went to Duke, so that's why I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, um, he seems to, it's also a cultural thing, isn't it? I mean, I guess it is an opportunity in not having access to, um, as he put it, the courts, but I understand where he's going from, you know, this ability of being part of, you're not part of the establishment, so you're not in a position to codify. Uh, yeah. but there's not even, it's not really even part of African American culture to want to do something like that, is it? I mean, it, it, or it tended not to be, to claim it's, ownership yeah. of. I, 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 and yeah, that's a strange one. And that's a, that was a quote we kind of struggled with because not everyone felt that way about okay. that, which was interesting, but we, we put it in there as a kind of direct comparison to show, well, there are some sections of African-American society that wouldn't have done that. And it was just about, here's my dance, let's share it. And everyone puts it into the, into the pot, as it were. The same with cooking and the same with cuisine, that you know, these recipes were just passed down from generation to generation. So these dances were passed down from generation to generation. And you would see your parents and your grandparents do it, and you would learn it and you would adapt it. But sometimes people named their moves. So we had to be clear, there were some tap dancers that had steps and right, had right. vocabulary, but as an overall cultural thing. Yeah, it wasn't about individual ownership. It was about, well, I'm just putting this out there to my community and everyone can do what they mm. want with it. And we see it now with music and sampling and, and things like that. Right, right, right. But what I find interesting too is, I mean, and I, I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense, but a lot of the people you talk to, you have a lot of, um, we have a, so an, ama an amazing cast of, of people uh, that you got uh, access to. Uh, but it's not just academics, although there's a sizable number of those. You've got all these choreographers, famous dancers, um, that even like um, um, even the sort of black uh, African American hip hop uh, dancers say they're influenced by seeing things like uh, West Side Story or you know Singing in the Rain or these sort of things. So it, it's this kind of um, it's it's a, it was a, it's a very difficult, nuanced subject to, to put into an hour and 30 minutes, I think. Yeah, which is hard. Mm. Yeah. Which is um, the of America. Yeah, well, that's what kept coming back to me. I mean, and I've, I've actually gone in um, the, we'll probably put some things in the show notes. Uh, who's the fellow at USC who's the hip hop um, artist? Uh, I mean, the expert. Um, Bell Durden. Yeah. Um, Yes, 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so, I mean, he, I, he's, I've, I found uh, YouTube clips with him and he goes into more detail. It's very interesting. You know, people ask questions and he's like, no, 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 there is an Irish influence on tap. And, you know, it's not just the Irish, actually, there was English clog dancing and there was Scottish Highlander moves that were incorporated yeah. and, and things like that. I think yeah, it, it's yeah. just, and then, and then even, the, you know, Again, we don't want to give away too much of the film, but, but you even had uh, some of these people who started codifying. They themselves were influenced by um, Eastern. Hugely. Well, when you, when you consider Jack Cole, who many consider as the founding father of yeah. theatrical jazz, not yes. jazz dance, but theatrical jazz, you know, he, he studied Eastern Indian uh, Bharatanathyam, um, classical Indian dance, yeah. um, temple dance, if you were. Uh, if you will. And uh, that is very, very much part of his technique, which was passed down to yeah. the likes of mathematics, and then that right. gets passed down to the next. So, so yeah, it, it's really worldwide. And, and, and I think in fairness, and I think, you know, um, I think it comes out in this film that uh, people like, well, certainly Maddox and others, um, I don't think Cole, uh, Cole, you didn't, they didn't even call it jazz dance themselves, did they? I mean, that's just what it got termed. But that's, they weren't trying to claim that it was, you know, jazz dance necessarily. This is where you get on that slippery slope of try, of, of not being, you know, a lot of the people aren't there to speak up for themselves. Yeah, They're yeah. no longer with us. So we had to be very careful and we wanted to be very respectful of what they actually did do because they did a lot of good and they were influenced and you have to work out that not all influence is appropriation, not all taking mm. of other people's work is appropriation. Sometimes it's admiration. So there's a very kind of slippery kind of definition. And so there are clear kind of moments of appropriation throughout history. And it is clear in jazz, but there are also a lot of moments of people loving something and bringing it into their work. And for us, it was really hard to work out how to identify, when to identify what was appropriation and what was something else. It essentially was called transmission, which where people just kind of exchanged ideas and yeah. exchanged dances. And you're right. There's, a, I mean, there's, I can, I can, we won't go down the list, but there's other American art forms I can think of where there is this, um, I mean, I'm from Texas originally, there's a music there that's all influenced by German and polkas and Spanish and some African American and it all gets m mashed up and uh, turns into this. Uh, I think one, it was the one quote, uh, America, uh, American culture just steals all these things and then just mat from these different cultures and then mashes them up. And that's yeah. what you get, you know, make something new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Hey, so, um, so I feel like, well, we're, we've obviously moved from a, a bit of a background on jazz dance and sort of the heart of what the film is, is, is about. Um, I mean, uh, Kadifa, I mean, I usually ask uh, our Yes, certainly the directors, uh, and I think we've kind of already getting to it. But you know, we're talking about the history of jazz dance. Um, I don't think what maybe you can give us a little synopsis of what the film is and what it's what it's about. Sure. So it's yes, it's the story of jazz dance, and that is the driving force. But it's also a kind of artistic exploration of American history because the two are intertwined. And I find that you need to understand the social and political context of art to understand why it was created and why it is the way it is and why it's been disrespected. And you can only do that by acknowledging the kind of systemic racism and the, the way America was founded on genocide and slavery. You can't, unless you acknowledge that, you can't sort of understand jazz dance and you can't understand why it is such a disparate art form that, that is up for so much debate. So that was why we kind of had those social and political elements in there too. And in your, I mean, going through this, if you've, is, is it more than just um, uh, a few people saying this? Is there, you know, is there evidence that pe a lot of people really don't know where, where jazz dance em emanates from? Is that, that that's yeah. true? It's, it's just not taught. And if it is taught, it's taught very broadly. So they'll just say it originated in America in X time period without going into the detail of what happened in slavery, the horrors yeah. of slavery and how that led to it, because there is direct correlation. So if you think about the Slave Act of 1739, when they had a rebellion organized by drums and said, well, any African court playing drums, your hands will get chopped off. 
So they move the rhythm inwards. That's a direct result of a political act that created an artistic form yeah. and started that journey. So if they just say broadly, oh, it came from America in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, whenever they want to date it from, or the 1920s, which a lot of the time they do from the jazz era, right. you don't get an understanding of what it really is. You just think it's a dance in a nightclub, mm. dance for fun, but it was about so much more. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that, that's why we kind of had to tie those things and why they're in, intrinsically linked. So, so Zach, you're the concept guy. Um, what did you start off? Oh, well, you had the concept. So what did you start off tr wanting to document or how did this, you know, how did this project kick, kick off? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and be brief with this answer. <laughs> <laughs> so around five years ago, I'm 38 now, around five years ago, I decided to do a degree. I didn't had never done a degree because they weren't. I didn't want to do one when I was eighteen yeah. years old. Yeah. So I decided to do a, a degree in my mid thirties. Uh, yeah. That was about five years ago, and um, I was in a. I've been a West End performer in West End shows for mm -hmm. nearly twenty years now, and I was having debates um, with people, just going, "What do you know about this? What do you know about this?" And it just so happened that I've known Kadifa for a good old 10, 12, 15 years or however long it is as well. It just so happened that Kadifa started working in the same building as me at the Savoy <laughs> Theatre in London. And I was like, no way. <laughs> and so so um, we were having a, de a, a debate um, in the quick change area. Uh, and I was like, I really want to do a film about jazz dance because I'm head of jazz dance at Millennium Performing Arts in London. Okay. Um, and, and I really want to do a film because there's, there's a lack of there's a lack of resource for students out there. There's also a lack of resource for professionals Obviously, I was having conversations with who right. knew nothing about it. So that's kind of the original kind of like spark. And then, and then Kadifa and I were just in in conversation for a good, I'd say, what two years before production, like yeah. doing research, going going to places, visiting different countries, kind of like just trying trying to find, you know, the genesis point, the starting point. Uh, so it really wasn't about my original concept. It was about Kadifa and I co-creating from an original kind of like spark of an idea, if that makes any sense. So, but so it wasn't was it... we hadn't said, I want to do a film about jazz dance. It was like, I was not looking to do a dance film. I was, you know, had my sight set somewhere completely different. And then yeah. he just said, I want to do this. And I thought, well, actually, it would be nice to mix the love of dance and film because I hadn't done that yet. And so I wouldn't have ever thought that there was anything even possible had he not asked me that one question on that one day, which is incredible when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and did you set out to make the definitive history of jazz dance? Was that was, or what was this, what were you originally thinking? Well, about you not really, because we, we start, we did a little trial run on Zach's thesis um, for his degree. And it was defining himself as artist. So we, we were more interested in lineage, weren't we Zach? Mm. That we both sort of realized well, actually we could trace our path as dancers and artists from these really big names. You know, six degrees of separation from Jack Cole, we realized we weren't that far away from him. Yeah. And then we met Lisa Don Marie, who's the film's producer. We said, look, we, we want to, you know, we sort of came to her with our sort of few ideas. And she said, it's good, but it's not big enough. You need, I don't know the history of jazz dance. And I think that's more interesting than just keeping it small and about your lineage and, and, and things like mm. that, just jazz dance. She just said that, she gave us that focus to kind of go, okay, the history of jazz dance, what does that mean? And it was bigger than ourselves, obviously. And that I think was the second moment of Genesis when we met with Lisa and we're like, oh, okay, this, this lady's given us a challenge and now this is a very clear direction in which to follow. And that's when, you know, the, re the reading and, and we suddenly became alert to conversations that were having, happening in the American jazz dance world that we weren't having in the British jazz dance world. And we probably wouldn't have found out about that had we not sort of researched, gone down that path. And what were those different co differences in conversations? That, um, there was a book that was being published around about the same time that Zach and I were first having our conversations um, by Lindsay Corino and Wendy Oliver. And they were two university professors um, that wanted to find more research for their jazz dance students and were just sick of photocopying articles for every class. So they were like, we need to do a book. So they started getting together various jazz practitioners, a lot of whom are in this film, because we sort of just ripped those, those great voices. 
Um, and they sort of came back to them and said, well, that's great if you want to do a, a book about jazz dance, but do know that there's a lot of black artists that are feeling ignored, that the roots aren't properly acknowledged. And so they did that work um, before us in sort of actually putting down the roots. And that's where the tree came from. They got that, the, the tree that Zach beautifully used. That's where that image came from. And that's what formed the basis for our film was the, the sort of tree growing and evolving. Um, so they were the catalyst to that within the jazz dance community. And we were able to read this book and use it as our starting point. So it was the mm. best jumping off point that we could have had as filmmakers. Excellent. And, and also then, nothing had actually been made visually, I guess, yes. that we could, yeah. we could show to people or I had really seen. There are documentaries and, and there are things that you can research and look up uh, about different sections and different parts of the jazz dance world, mm -hmm. uh, but nothing that kind of encapsulated all. Um, <laughs> encapsulating all turned it out, turned out to be quite, it's, it's, it's quite a feat. It's yeah. quite a feat. We, I don't think we got it all. I think yeah. we got a lot, but I wouldn't say that we got it like 100% of it all. No. Well, I, so vast. I think you've got the visual equivalent of that of that book basically it's a you know any good you're never going to capture it all so you've got a good jumping off certainly yep. an excellent jumping off point um i mean one thing i picked up on and maybe it's wrong but i in it maybe kind of goes back to some of these definitional issues but and i, I think you've kind of alluded to um this uh point you made about a lot of the um uh, black um uh people in the field of feeling a bit um um, aggrieved or maybe I'm trying to find the right words for it, but is there, is there this conflict basically between the sort of codified and communal performance versus vernacular establishment elite versus protest? And is this kind of way back when now, is that where hip hop is born? Yeah, it all comes out of protest and comes out of a need to have your say and have your voice. However that happened, whether it was jazz, whether it's hip hop, they're all cultures that stem out of oppression and out of wanting to speak out. And jazz was just an iteration of that. Um, and you see it happen over time, various music and art forms over time. So yeah, it absolutely is born out of that. Mm. And um, I, think, uh, I think this is, We've been going for, I think, about a half an hour now. I think we'd, it's maybe a good time to give our uh, listeners a bit of a break. Um, and uh, besides giving them a break and a chance to hear about our uh, sponsor, uh, we'll also give them a chance to listen or and or watch, if they're on YouTube, uh, an alternative uh, trailer. Uh, they've already seen or heard the, uh, the, the first trailer, but this uh, kind of gets back to this... Uh, this conflict, this tension that you've alluded to. And it's also kind of, uh, I think sets us up for when we come back, which is sort of looking forward into um, the, the, the future of, of, of jazz dance. So uh, uh, let's, uh, listeners, you can have a break and uh, do, do stick around though and listen to that uh, trailer. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. A great jazz dancer has a strong sense of self. A great jazz dancer isn't afraid to get dirty. Jazz is an opportunity for everyone to bring their own culture, their own style, and it's really what they feel in, in their heart and their soul. A great jazz dancer knows how to focus, how to get the audience to look at them and say, this is what I want you to look at. It's like the great jazz musicians. There are a lot of people that can hit the notes, but can they put it together? Can they make gumbo with it? Can they shush it? You know, that's jazz dancing.
Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with uh, Kadifa Wong, director of Uprooted, The Journey of Jazz Dance, based on the original concept and idea of Zach Nemeran, who's also provided many other uh, aspects to the film, including some choreography. Um, I want to uh, read a quote from the Hollywood Reporter, actually. I think it's an excellent one. Um, Uprooted couldn't be more timely, a thoughtful and impassioned look at the often ignored roots of, of a quintessential American art form, one that can be traced back to people enslaved by the nascent nation. Her documentary offers, because they referred to you in the previous sentence, her documentary offers an enriching corrective to the official story of jazz dance, taking it beyond its already fascinating and complex showbiz luster to profoundly political terrain. Uh, so that's the film Uprooted, The Journey of Jazz Dance. Um, oh, by the way, Zach, did I recognize a cameo by you in the, in the film? Did oh, you? yes, I, I have appeared. I, I took part in a, in a couple of um, classes at, um, uh, where was it, Steps on Broadway. So okay. I was in the music and Fields class. I went okay. into Blackstone's class just as a dancer myself, just because I wanted to kind of immerse myself in the experience. Yeah, no, I think, I think it was great. I didn't notice it until the uh, second time around. I just kind of happened to look up and was like, wait a minute, I think I'm going to be talking to that guy uh, later today. Um, what's, so what's the future of jazz dance? I mean, um, um, I don't want to go into all, I mean, your, your film, I, I hope, you know, we'll talk about how people are going to be able to see this eventually, but, uh, um, uh, and I don't want to give anything away, but I don't think we are. Uh, but if, if you don't mind, where do you see the future of jazz dance going or what's, what's the next hip hop basically? Gosh, that's a very difficult question. I don't think hip hop much the same as vernacular jazz will ever die because yeah. it's a cultural thing. So uh, Monsell says it very well in all of his, you know, all of his mm -hmm. seminars that he gives and everything. And he says bits in our, in our film, you know, hip hop, is culture. Debbie Allen said that it's culture and you know, it will never die. It will just morph and yeah. transition into something else. And, and is jazz dance, um, it's just come to me. I mean, is, is jazz dance sort of like jazz music? I mean, because jazz music, goes, I mean, I'm a big fan of, I, I was actually saddened in a way to hear that it was the death of the, but I'm a big fan of bebop, right? So, um, I, you know, I love Miles Davis and all these people. And then I find out that I, it was the death knell for this relationship between jazz music and jazz dance. But, um, um, but it goes through these waves and there's all these people know it needs to be 1920s, 40s period, or, oh no, it's bebop. But bebop's now over uh, 60, almost 70 years old, almost coming on. Um, and you know the there's this risk that things become art forms become sort of uh to use the british expression you know uh sort of coded in aspic and just kind of preserved instead of um evolving you know and is is it possible maybe that's kind of that's essentially the, it's sort of something similar with something like yeah they did, and it's funny because they did leave each other but they did also come back because i remember doing a lot of my dance training in the jazz dance classes to acid jazz and groups right. like and New Jersey Kings were, and Grover Washington Jr. and right, right. Killer Quartet. So we did it in both my jazz dance classes and my contemporary dance classes. So I think you find that they just kind of morph into whatever is the music of the day, but you can, as artists change, and some of those modern jazz artists started looking back for inspiration. So did the dance, the choreographers and the dance teachers would look back for inspiration at the music and the jazz music. So it just never, it's always been a kind of exchange and a kind of a relationship where I guess they just break up and get back together again. And yeah. it will continue to do that depending on what the musicians are doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, um, I mean, you guys can tell me better than, than I can say, uh, uh, I guess like any art or art form, it's just, you can't maybe, you can't really manage these things. Can you, they, they just kind of, they're, they're products of their Melu and, things change well more things change more they remain the same unfortunately in some cases but um i mean maybe that brings us back this to a question i was going to have in terms of the current context because i don't think we can talk about this in uh, in the july of 2020 and i think this will air at the end of the month or early august of um we're only a year or two removed from me too and now we've got black lives matter and uh Difa is a woman and a woman of color. I mean, what, 
you know, it's, uh, as, as I said, the Hollywood Reporter referred to this as it couldn't be more timely. Um, and I agree. Um, how do you, I mean, uh, maybe your own personal views of how things are going and how you see your, your project, your film fitting into this, this discussion. Yeah, that because States. that quote in itself was, that quote in itself was a very strange one because we finished the film, like the edit pretty much was finished last year in August. Right. So it was a long way before the events of this year happened. And for me, have sort of, a lot of the subjects in that and a lot of the issues that we tackled were my way of having a voice because when Trump was elected in 2016, we had Brexit as well. I could feel the shift mm. of racism, xenophobia, nationalism already. And I remember being silenced by so many people telling me Trump was harmless. But even from the sort of birth that when he started spouting the birth of conspiracy about Obama, it's like that's an overt act of racism. Mm. And everyone is okay with this. Like he's getting airtime and, and those were the signals and the warning signs then for me. So it feels like it's a little bit too late because we're, we had the warning signs and that this film was my way of issuing a warning sign and showing that what's happened in the past, look at what we're trying to say. These black lives do matter because look at the art forms that they have created. So it was a very interesting quote to say that it's timely when we're like, oh, but, you know, we were thinking these things before it became, I don't know, what do you want to call it, mainstream or the new right. stuff kind of changed the way they described things because before that, no one would describe, describe Donald Trump or Boris Johnson as a racist when they are. And they're, they're, it's not just their words, their actions actually state that and, and prove that beyond any reasonable doubt. So it's a very strange thing for me, but it was a very interesting one um, that the film, all of these things happened as the film came out. Cause it's like, I wonder how this has changed people's perception and whether they would have been so willing to accept what we were stating was the history of jazz dance and the roots, because we know that there's been huge debates and even just some of the dance conferences I attended, hearing people resist this message that a lot of the dancers and, and practitioners were trying to say and, and talk about the roots of jazz dance, they weren't willing to listen, but I think they're willing to listen now. So I think maybe we debuted this film with some kinder ears, which I mm. think was, Thing and a good thing for the film because it meant our message was heard with a bit more of a favorable kind of understanding and a willingness. People were willing to hear what we had to say. I mean, you have a gr uh, there's a great quote from the film uh, that you pointed us towards, and I think I'm happy to share. It's uh, America, we don't teach aspects of history, particularly the eras, areas in which African Americans have had a vital participatory role. That was Professor Robin Gee. Now, mm -hmm. Um, I think she's at UNCG, I believe. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the uh, you spend a lot of time in North Carolina, I think. I noticed that a lot of the <laughs> professors are in different places around there. Um, but um, I mean, I think that's, I mean, we've had other, uh, we've discussed other documentaries on the podcast. We've looked at the uh, James Baldwin documentary that came out a few years ago. Um, there's, there's some other discussions. I mean, I think it's true. They, they were... Um, they uh, raise points, they're very illuminating, and I think you just, for whatever reason, fall on, um, certainly in the US, um, they fall on deaf ears many times, and maybe it just, unfortunately, as society, sometimes we need a, a kick in the rear end sometimes to take, to rear up and take notice uh, of things. Um, but I thought, it, but all that said, I mean, um, I, you know, I'm not here, I don't usually just read quotes, but uh, I mean, you do discuss yours as being an honest conversation about jazz dance, and we've already talked about that. It's not about, um, it's not all about its appropriation. It's all about understanding where uh, I think is this very subtle, very nuanced argument, and I think you do it extremely well in terms of what was admiration and what people were doing, adding to the sort of creative creativity um of the art form so um um but if i may so to both of you you know as we're actually i'm hard it's hard to believe this has been going very quickly and i've really enjoyed this uh we're starting to get towards the end of our time together but how did you two get into jazz dance what or is that or you were you kadifa were you into jazz dance as well or is it or just Zach? Yeah, sort of. Well, we both, Zach and I both trained under the same lady, the late, great Jackie Mitchell. Um, and she was a 
descendant of mathematics as teaching and she brought his isolation technique to London. Correct me if I'm wrong, Zach. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. So that was where I first started doing jazz dance because I was a contemporary dancer um, all of my life, ballet and contemporary. And then I came into jazz when I started my professional dance training, but I didn't feel like that was where I was welcomed the most, ironically. And we weren't, because we weren't taught about the history and the roots, and how it related to me as a black woman, I didn't really, wasn't really interested in it because it was just a lot of hair flicking and superficial. It was very superficial. superficial. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I moved into contemporary dance because, you know, we were getting more of an internal journey and what we were being taught. And I was interacting more with choreographers of color from in the contemporary world. So it was more important for me that way. But I always loved jazz dance and I always wanted to do it. And I was kind of raised on those dance films of Staying Alive, Flashdance, mm. Chorus Line, um, all these, nice. you know, that's, that was what I wanted to do, but I was just never able to do it because there just wasn't the opportunity in the UK to do those kind of dances. Right. There was no jazz dance companies, there was, or there was very few. And so it was really hard to do that. So I had to go into contemporary, but that's how my jazz journey went. And then, meeting Zach and seeing his renewed, you know, he renewed my love for mathematics technique and my love for jazz dance mm. as a whole. And that was because Zach was teaching it and I would do his class and, and things like that. Okay. And Interestingly I enough, I, I had a very similar journey, again, taught by the late, great Jackie Mitchell. Uh, uh, but my journey was very different as a, as a mixed race guy. Um, mm. You know, I, I just took to it like a, a duck to water and you know mm. subsequently had a almost 20 well still have but had a kind of almost 20 year performing career in musical theater so which is jazz dance incarnate really and i was lucky enough to work with so many a very different group of choreographers and directors not just mm. kind of like a select few that i kind of sponged every bit of information from so many different people that I worked with. So I just feel lucky and grateful to have worked with so many people, which has informed me as a, as a more of an emerging choreographer in life right. yeah. um, to, to, to create informed jazz dance rather than just the flicky of the hair jazz dance as, as Katifa may have been talking about earlier on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there you go. I mean, I think, it, or, um, well, I mean, uh, actually, this brings me something that comes up in the, the, the film too, this idea of where, I mean, we, we talked about what's the future. I mean, I wasn't aware that there's this whole situation where, now that I know what jazz dance is, uh, there's this whole situation where there's so few companies now. Um, and um, uh, one of the, I think one of your guests talks about, uh, what did she call it? Um, um, there's the uh, get a job, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of, uh, you know, you do what, and then people are talking about it. It's all about, uh, it's becoming tricksy. It's all about how many flips you can do and things like that. Um, and uh, yet everyone you've got on there, even the ones that are choreographers, they all sound like uh, professors in the best sense of the word. You know, they're very studious and very, uh, intellectual and have really thought through this it's a it's very it, it's a very interesting um uh dynamic i think you've caught there i think yeah. that's the reason why they're successful because they are informed or more informed than most i mean we haven't don't wanna, oh sorry was, go ahead you just don't want to make you know doing that kind of entertainment dance is, is a skill set in itself and right. creating dances that the, the crowds like is a skill set in itself and there is a gift in it, you know, people are seeing jazz dance, maybe they're not seeing the type of jazz dance you want them to see, but they are looking in it, a good starting point, as, as, yeah. as fixy and as flippy as, as it is, but it, there's still some merit in, in that kind of dancing, I think. Well, I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the talking heads does mention the, uh, yes, there's that element, but the flip side is more people, again, are getting interested into, into dance, so, um, which, um, it's interesting. We've had a, quite a few um, very different subjects, nothing related to dance, but we've had a lot of, t uh, you know, it's funny or it's interesting how much the 80s, particularly the 90s keep coming up. And I know we're in a period where the 90s are very hot right now and things like that. But uh, 
this was, you know, people were saying dance was everywhere in the 80s and 90s. And I mean, you touch on that too, what, you know, what's happened there as well. Uh, but um, it, is, uh, it, is, it is interesting to, to have gone through this sort of period and, you know, maybe there's a, there will be this time of renewal and, and, and uh, rebirth. Um, now you've, I was, so Kadifa, you made the switch to filmmaking. This is your feature debut, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, um, and documentary filmmaking at that. Uh, I mean, but both of you, what do you think you've seen that as an, um, that maybe an American filmmaker might've missed? Cause we, uh, um, the producers of this podcast is Alamo Pictures and the uh, remit is documentary films from a European or international perspective. So do you think there's an outsider? What, what sort of, what was your unique viewpoint or sort of insights that you were able to provide being uh, uh, at least uh, Brit by British origin? Uh, film? Yeah, I think it was that we could step back and look at it as a whole. Um, and we weren't tied to any bias or any allegiance to anything American. Um, cause I know in England, when we interviewed people in Britain, I had certain allegiances like, Oh, let's interview that person because they were instrumental or this institution because they're this. So you have those, you have those little implicit kind of moments that you want to favor. Whereas going into the States, I went, I didn't go as a dancer. So the dance world was, everyone was on equal terms with me. So I didn't need to favor anybody. It was about what you had to say. Um, and I think that was allowed me to be impartial. Um, and just things like the university's dance programs and systems I didn't really know, knew exist and the level of funding that they get and the sort mm. of facilities, it was, it was incredible. We, we just don't have that in the UK. So I, I you know, yeah, it, it opened up my eyes to something completely different, the way that they approach dance. And I know it's not perfect, but you know, over here with the academy system that we have, it was it was very, very different. So yeah, I think we just brought a more open-minded view to it that we, and it would have been maybe different if we'd made a film about the UK Jazz Dance World, Zach. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think, I think we, it, it's definitely important as documentarians to step back and listen to everyone and take in everyone's views. I mean, we, how many were, what, 51 interviewees, four countries, 11 cities. And actually that's only 51 interviewees that made it into the final cut of this right. version. <laughs> so we, I think we got 75 to 80 interviewees in total. So interviews in total. So it's, I think as Brits, it was very important for us to just yeah. listen yeah. and not let anyone dictate anything to us. And you got, I mean, that must have been amazing to interview Cheetah Rivera. Oh, and God. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you a little story. So, oh, uh, yeah, we love stories here. <laughs> she is one of my all time favorite artists since I was a child. I've loved yeah. Cheetah Rivera. And then when I found out that I actually was going to interview Cheetah, <laughs> I mean, my heart stopped. Love the woman. After the interview happened, she walked out. I think I nearly fainted in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I actually just on the floor. I was like, oh, my God. But, um, but yeah, no, wonderful. And, and Graziella Danielle as well, who, oh who was with her yeah. in the same interview. It was just, I mean, I may as not, not have been there. Like, you could just turn on the camera and let yeah. them speak because they yeah. were amazing. Wonderful. And, yeah, there's a one. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, it's a stroke of genius on our producer's part that I think that was our first New York interview. She scheduled it and it was like, right, for New York, we kick off with Cheetah Rivera. And you're like, that's brilliant. That is the best way to kick off New York. So I think she scheduled us well for that because it just set the pace for the rest of the, the shoot. Yeah. That's so then also later on down the line, we had Debbie Allen as well, yeah. which is one of Kadifa's, oh, one of Kadifa's kind of queens. Yes. <laughs> We well, see, we see. I'm old enough. I remember uh, the TV show Fame, and you know, oh. Debbie, you know, and and things like that. And that's again gets back to this '80s, '90s uh, zeitgeist, basically, where dance was and not realizing at the time, but dance was so readily available. Absolutely, Fame was the first TV show I think I was actually allowed to watch. I was like, three or four when it first came out, and okay. just you know, it was like this woman came on and was just incredible and the way she was so disciplined and every dance teacher I had, if they were like Lydia Grant, I was like, that. that's it, that's the dance teacher I want. So I, I really responded to any dance teacher that, you know, 
came and was really harsh on you and stuff and it's like oh this means they care it was absolutely <laughs> amazing to interview her and I luckily didn't gush and I wanted to say like you made me but yeah. didn't thankfully kept my cool <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um the uh, uh, and and some oh again we don't want to spoil there's some great stories that come out of this the these these interviews besides the the commentary and the the, the history um uh, but I want to say, let me give a shout out to your, um, who's your director of photography? Because oh. the way you capture the the dance is, I mean, if, even if you don't care about the story or whatever, I think just watching some of these scenes of the of dancing is just absolutely amazing. Yeah, Matt Simpkins is, uh, he, and he's a dancer too. So okay. I think that was one of the things when we sort of met him and found out he was a dancer and Lisa introduced us, it was like he was so on board with what we wanted to do because we just said we don't want to film it front on and right. have from the audience because it did start off as a documentary about dance for dancers. Originally, we were only targeting mm. dancers at the very, very beginning. So we were like, you know, Matt, we want it to look dancerish, and he was like, say no more. And I think the first time, you know, we got to Chicago, he had no rehearsal, no setup. They said, oh, we prepared this dance number for you. And he was like, okay, it's 11 minutes long, so they can only do it once. And he had to just get in there and just move around. And I've never seen anyone look, you know, like the color had been drained out of them, but he had to go filming like a continuous thing for like 11 minutes, all these dancers rushing about. But yeah, his visuals are absolutely incredible. And it was just exactly what we wanted for the film, this immersive, this is how dancers see class. This is how we see rehearsal. This is the little mm. bits of body parts. That's how we focus and hone in on things to learn. And that's mm. what we want to mirror. And he, he got that from day one, you know, it was brilliant. It was a brilliant collaboration. And, and I liked how you also went to, you know, you're, you're in Calgary, you're in all kinds of places that you wouldn't normally think of for, uh, for certainly for jazz dance, or at least to the layman's uh, uh, knowledge and uh, and I think the people you capture there they're all they all seem so so genuine and um, yeah. it's 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 beautiful it's actually that that in of itself I think uh, those some of those segments are, are can be are works of art you know very very compelling stuff yeah. um, I have loads of questions but I'm going to wrap things <laughs> I'm going to try to wrap <laughs> things up um, um, uh, for those I, I just want to also say well, whose idea was the uh, I don't want to give too much away because it came as a quite a surprise to me when I was watching. But there is this White Knight's cameo. Whose idea was that to throw that in? <laughs> okay, okay it no, it's all say yeah. no more. But yeah, no, go ahead. But uh, it was we wanted Gregory Hines is so influential and so key, and it was like, how do we get him in this film? Because sadly, he's no longer with us. And it was right, like, right. when I saw, I remember going back to watch White Knights as part of research and that monologue, I was just like, well, this is just everything in a nutshell, in whatever, 30 seconds of whatever, however long it is, this is everything. And I don't know if, he, if this, it felt like he, when I watched it, it felt like he, Gregory Hines himself, had gone off script mm, and mm. gone on a monologue. And I thought, that's perfect. This is how we get Gregory in the film. And <laughs> I could, and then, and then your producer's trying to remind you how much that archival footage is going to cost. <laughs> and, uh, but you, somehow you still got it in there. Somehow we did. And big thanks to Taylor Hackford for saying, yeah, sure. Absolutely. He was very generous and very kind. So we, we say mad props to Taylor Hackford for allowing us to appropriate his work a little bit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> hey, hey, so, well, we've already kind of, you, we've already talked about some of the challenges now of uh, being filmmakers and, um, uh, in terms of what's going on now with COVID and things like that. But uh, and I know you're concentrating on the project at hand and, and long may you enjoy it, but what, what's next for, for the both of you? Well, I'm doing a um, teaming up again with a few of the people from Uprooted and we're um, the editor specifically, Joan Jill Amarim. Um, she's an American as well and lives in the UK and she used to be a football player and she and I really enjoyed um, capturing the, you know, the way we edited Matt's movement and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to do something movement-y again. So we're looking at something about women's football. Um, so that's, yeah, or soccer, as the Americans would say. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a legitimate that's, word. <laughs> <laughs> that's in early stages, and we're hoping that we're going to sort of get the ground, and then we're exploring some other options. And Zach and I will always be working on something together. Um, mm -hmm. 
joined at the hip that way creatively. So we're, we're exploring a few options um, and we've got a few things in the pipeline. Okay. And Zach, Zach, I've seen your bio. I know you're a busy man, but what's, uh, <laughs> what's next for you? So I, I continue to be head of jazz dance at Millennium Performing Arts. That continues every single year. Um, <laughs> I, I would like... I'm going to put this out there. I would like to start my own jazz company. We have very few in the UK. I can think mm. of maybe one or two. I would like my own company. So that's, that's kind of where I would put energy in the future. Okay. Yeah. Well, if anyone <laughs> with means is listening or watching this podcast and has been motivated by this to, uh, by, uh, to learn more about jazz uh, dance, we'll put what you will have links to your different uh, social media accounts and things like that in the show notes so they can reach out to you. But uh, I think that sounds like, that sounds like a great idea. Um, um, and I think, um, um, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's excellent. I think also if you wanted to leverage the, what you've already done, I think there's a lot of individual subjects that you could even uh, out of this film explore further, you know, Mm -hmm. uh some of the people i mean i first of all i actually just have to make a mention because we haven't even mentioned her uh but you could you know i don't know if there's a Catherine dunham um doc out there or not and it'd be difficult you know, my hope is that anyone now that we've opened the door for any dancers to turn filmmakers and start making individual stories because every sort of five minutes go by in this film and you're like that's a film in itself and that was what was so challenging to edit was trying to work out how much airtime you gave when you knew each moment was a film yeah. that could be, you know, you could film 90 minutes with just this one subject. Right. And so the hope is that now that they've seen it can be done, that there is an appetite for it, that other dancers will now start making films about these subjects because it needs to come from a dancer's perspective, I think, um, along with, you know, filmmakers and stuff. But, you know, dancers need to sort of take hold of their narrative and their stories and, and really put them out there. In the, in the film world to preserve them for legacy because we don't often, we can't often hold on to it because it ha happens on stage or it happens on the streets and it's not always filmed. And if Zach, if you don't mind, I think I'm gonna let Kadifa have the last word on that. I think that's a great way if, if you're okay <laughs> with that. Um, all right, I see the thumbs up. Um, so I just want to um, thank uh, Kadifa Wong and um, Zach Nimmerin, the filmmakers behind Uprooted, The Journey of Jazz Dance for coming on to the podcast. It's been a, a pleasure having you on. Um, I want to give a shout out to This Is Distorted uh, Studios here in Leeds, England. And to remind you to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.